message today is based on Revelation chapter 14, starting with verse 14. So I invite you to go ahead and look that up in your Bibles if you want. I have these slides up here for you as well, but it's always good to check my verses and keep me honest. Amen? So uh, here we go. Revelation chapter 14, and this is our verse. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. I want us to just think about that for a minute. I looked and behold a white cloud. And seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hands. I meant to bring my sharp sickle today. I forgot it before I left the house. Dorothy Craven gave me a sharp sickle from her storage shed when she was getting rid of some of her tools, and I forgot to bring my sharp sickle. Those of us today, as we read a verse like this, we may not even know what a sharp sickle is, unless maybe you've heard or seen pictures of the Grim Reaper, right? The, the uh, mythical figure of death. Uh, it's an old tool used by people years ago to harvest grain, kind of a hooked knife on the end of a stick. Verse continues, And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle, crossed the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he took a sharp sickle. He too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who had authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia from Beaver, Utah to Salt Lake City. From Salt Lake City to Pocatello, from Salt Lake City to Rock Springs, Wyoming, from Salt Lake City to Elko, Nevada, the blood flowed as high as a horse's bridle. So high the horses had to lift their noses up to keep on breathing. This is a bloody passage, friends. <laughs> this is a bloody verse. What do we do with it? I think what we do with it is I think we recognize that there are three kinds of blood. There are three kinds of blood. By the way, I could probably have just skipped my sermon today and let Tanya's children's story stand on its own. Because she said everything in that children's story that needs to be said today, and that, and praise God for that. Thank you. Because that says everything we need to say. There are three kinds of blood. In this story, in this prophecy, there's the blood of the wicked, and there's the blood of Christ, and there's the blood of the saved, or we could say the blood of the saints. There are three kinds of blood. And each one of these has something to do with what this verse means and what this verse is about. And I'm going to start by looking at this first one, the blood of the wicked. It's simple. This one doesn't take very much time. This one won't put me past the hour. This is just simple. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. That's it. The reality in our world is that if you are outside of relationship with God, death eternal 
awaits you. That's the promise, if you will. The wages of sin is death. But thank God, amen, for the blood of Christ. I think we began our song service that way, right? (laughs) Good news for you today. The blood never, ever loses its power. Amen. Thank you for that. The Apostle Paul has much to say about this blood of Christ. And it's vital that we understand that. Because God's timing, when it comes to the wine press, God's timing for us is perfect. While we were still weak. At the right time, it says, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still his enemies, Christ died for us. He goes on, since therefore we now have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. See, the blood of Christ is the blood that prevents the winepress, that removes the winepress of the wrath of God, that sets us free from what is the reality for humanity without God. The situation is hopeless without the substitutionary atonement in the blood of Christ. I love the fact that the Apostle Paul recognizes that. And the language that he uses for this blood of Christ and the effect of the blood of Christ as shed for us is this, reconciliation. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now, I want you to notice something. Highlighted and bolded. Reconciled, reconciled, reconciliation. I love how Scripture just sometimes takes a word and just uses that word and uses that word and uses that word to show us what it's really trying to say. And what we find when we read in Romans 5 about the blood of Christ is we we find that the blood of Christ achieves and accomplishes reconciliation. Reconciliation. I had a rough weekend this weekend. And I had a rough weekend because I'm a fallen, sinful human being. Uh, I don't know if you have this problem, but sometimes family gatherings are challenging. I mean, we like to think, right, our family's perfect, and you have a family gathering and everything goes great. But there's, when I go to a family gathering... My deepest insecurities and my greatest pride rise up from the depths of somewhere that I do not know. And I find myself defensive, critical, judgmental, and unkind. Anybody else? Can I get a witness? (laughs) I'm so glad I'm not alone. (laughs) Praise God. And I was all of those at my family gathering this last weekend. And it didn't end well because I thought I was doing a good job of kind of hiding some of that. But the very, very end, My grandson's one-year birthday celebration. At the very, very end, the devil got the best of me. And I got into a big argument with my own dear dad. And it did not end well. It ended with angry words. 
and me driving out of the parking lot. It wasn't until quite a while later that I received a text message from my son. And I want you to imagine, right? My dad, me, my son, his son. Four generations. And my son was writing me about reconciliation. Amen? Amen? But his words of reconciliation were really hard words for this dad to hear from his own son. You know what part of what he said was? If you ever bring that to a family gathering again, I'm going to ask you to leave. And... I'm going to do everything I can to help you reconcile your relationship with your dad. Part of what he expressed to me was, I don't want my son to grow up seeing that kind of stuff. And I didn't know how to tell him that even if I do everything perfectly, your son's still going to grow up seeing that kind of stuff. But I'm going to do everything I can in my power that he not see that kind of stuff from me. My son, who's not a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, was instructing me about how to be a peacemaker. And that brought me to my knees. And... It began the work of reconciliation between me and my father, me and my son, me and my grandson. (laughs) Because I owe him him an apology for ruining his birthday. It's his birthday, and he can cry if he wants to, right? (laughs) But nobody else should be crying. God's all about reconciliation. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? See, sometimes we talk about salvation, and we think salvation means being reconciled. And right here in Romans 5, Paul says that once you are reconciled, then you really become about the work of salvation. Once you're reconciled, then you shall be saved. It sounds to me like the apostle is saying that reconciliation isn't the end, it's the beginning. Being set right with God isn't where you stop, it's where you start. You go on from there. More than that, he says, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. And right there, I think he's talking about something more. He's not just saying that you have received reconciliation. He's saying you have received a call to be a reconciler, to be a peacemaker, to be somebody who grabs one hand over here and one hand over there and pulls those two hands together and says, be reconciled. Amen. The blood of the saved is what we need to talk about next. What will it cost you To bring life to somebody else. Tanya, thank you for that children's story. What will it cost you to bring life to somebody else? Could you be like that six-year-old boy that thought he was giving his life for his sister? That thought that as the blood came out of his vein into the veins of his sister, he would die and she would live. Can any of us pay that price? That says, I'm willing to die to myself in order to bring life to somebody else, to bring reconciliation, to bring restoration into the life of someone else, can we do that? In the spirit of this same call and gift of reconciliation, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes this. It's almost like he said, okay, chapter 5 of Romans, I'm going to hit it. Chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, I'm going to hit it. And he didn't even have chapter numbers. Praise God it worked out that way. It helps me remember. 
We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. The apostle seems to understand that that we will do things in the body and those things will be either one or the other. They'll be good or they'll be evil. And I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes it's both. Any given moment, I struggle. But he goes on. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, what do we do? We persuade others. He goes on about that a little bit, and then he says, For the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ controls us. Once God has gotten a hold of our hearts, he moves us in a direction for a purpose and for a ministry that looks like this. For we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. See, Paul has this understanding of the death of Christ. The death of Christ is not just a Jew dying 2,000 years ago on a cross. The death of Christ is all humanity dying 2,000 years ago on a cross. The death he died, he died for all. That one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all. That those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who raised, who for their sake died and was raised. See, the death of Christ does something in us. And what the death of Christ does in us is is it it dissolves our self-centeredness. It dissolves our tendency to protect, to be defensive, to argue, to fight, to win. At all costs, the death of Christ shows us that there's another way to defeat evil. Yeah, we can kill, but we can also lay down our lives. And the death of Christ shows that there's more power in self-sacrifice than there is in slaughtering someone. Even if you're right, even if you're justified, in what you do. That we, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. I don't know about you, but the love of Christ compels me. It controls me. When I fully embrace and fully recognize and fully realize exactly what he did for me in that moment on the cross. Think of the options that Jesus would have had on the cross. He was wrongly accused, wrongly condemned. Oh, he, they weren't wrong when they said that he claimed he was the Son of God. He did. <laughs> they weren't wrong when they claimed that he made himself equal with God, and they called that blasphemy. It wasn't. But Jesus could have easily levitated from that cross And shown everybody watching why he was right and all these people were wrong. And yet he doesn't. He doesn't. He was the most right anybody has ever been. And he said, you know what? My bad. And literally what he said to us all is, your bad is my bad. I will own it. I will own the sin problem. I will own the separation from God. It's on me. Even as the people say, his blood be on us and on our children. He says, no, your blood be on me, child of God. The Apostle Paul gets that. But he not only acknowledges the death, he acknowledges the resurrection. He didn't just die. He rose. Because he rose, everything is different. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. What does that mean? 
It means as human beings living in this world, don't ever look at somebody in some horizontal, two-dimensional way. They are more than that. They're more than that guy that cuts you off in traffic. Notice I bring that one up a lot. I don't like that guy. But they're more than that. They're more than whatever pain or unkindness or, or ugliness you experience out there in the world. They are more than that. They're children of God. So we no longer regard anyone according to the flesh, even though we, want, we were once regarded. Sorry, let me try again. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. Even though we once thought that that's all he was. And Paul can say that with all sincerity because Saul of Tarsus thought Jesus was just a man. Saul is saying, Paul is saying, yeah, I once regarded him according to the flesh. And boy, was I wrong when he knocked me off my donkey on the road to Damascus. He's more than that. We regard him thus no longer. (laughs) I'll never make that mistake again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come, and I'll never be the same again. And then he cites the source. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. See, it's not enough to be reconciled. It's, it's a ministry of reconciliation then that we are called to. I had somebody this morning in Bible study ask me the question, is it too soon to be trying to win other people to Christ? <laughs> no. If you've been reconciled, the ministry of reconciliation is yours. That's the very next step, of course. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. On the cross, God was reconciling the world to himself. Your blood be on me. My bad. Your bad, I will take as mine. Not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So this is how we see ourselves. We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal now in this world through us. And then here's the message. Here's the sermon. We, our lives, are to be preached to the world. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. If you've been reconciled, make it contagious. If God has restored his relationship with you, be one who restores relationships. Now imagine how embarrassed I was when my son did what I'm called to do, reconciliation, restoration. Be reconciled, he tells me. I have a smart kid. At least give me that. I raised a good man. Amen. Amen. It's not easy to be a patriarch. It's not easy to be dad in the family. One thing a young man discovers when he gets into his 30s is his dad wasn't quite as perfect as he thought he was. Yeah. Father Abraham. Father Abraham teaches us something powerful powerful about faith. The Apostle Paul in Romans 4, right before Romans 5, teaches us this. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. And he had been told, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. Remember that story? Abraham just gets done defeating the king of, the king, or I should say freeing the king of Sodom from being held by another king. The king of Sodom offers Abraham all the wealth 
says, you know what? You set me free. My kingdom is your kingdom now. Abraham turns it down. Abraham is essentially saying, I don't want the kingdom of Sodom, <laughs> right? I want the kingdom of God. I, want, I don't want the king of Sodom to be able to say, you see, Abraham, see how successful he is? I did that. I made him rich, king of Sodom. You don't want that on your resume, right? So, Abraham turns it all down, walks away sad, empty, broken. God says to him, don't worry, Abraham, I am your shield. I am your very great reward. Abraham's not so happy about that. He says to God, well, what will you give me since I have no children? Hebrew word, take a casual glance. Do you see any babies around here? God says, listen, buddy, step outside. Takes him outside. Shows him the stars of heaven. He says, you're looking in the wrong direction. You're looking down. Looking on the two-dimensional plane for my blessing. You look up. Look three-dimensionally. Look fourth-dimensionally. Look into all nine, ten, eleven dimensions. Look. Abraham looks up. It's a starry night. Sky is clear. Like God's saying, can you count them? Can you reach them? Boy, what did we learn about the outer space this week, right? The telescope images that come back billions of light years away. That doesn't blow your mind. Abraham looks at those stars, and God says, so shall your offspring be. Here it is. Paul quoting that verse in Romans 5, Romans 4. So shall your offspring be. What is the Father really saying? Not as many as the stars, but as from heaven itself. You're worried about offspring? Your offspring doesn't come from down here, Abraham. Your offspring comes from here. The offspring. My offspring. Jesus himself. And this is what Paul tells us about Abraham's response. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, that he was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. I mean, you got to admit, we'd struggle a little bit, right? You find yourself at that situation where God's calling you to something really great, and you're like, I can't do that. Sarah can't do that. Having children, um, not a promise we can keep. 100-year-old man. Barren woman? I don't think so. It looks pretty impossible. Yet this is what Paul says about Abram. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Promises of God in you aren't your job. They're God's job. Amen? And Abraham was fully convinced that God had the power to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. What is faith? Believing God. When he walks you outside and he shows you the stars and says, put your eyes on my son Jesus. That's faith. What is faith? Faith is believing that God has the power to do what he has promised through Jesus in your life. That's faith. When you have that kind of faith, it is credited to him as righteousness. And it's great that God spoke to Abraham and that God gave Abraham that, but you know what? God wasn't just speaking to Abraham, God's speaking to you. And how do I know that? Because Paul says so. But the words that was counted him were not written for his sake alone, but also for yours. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead... Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised up for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 
This would be a great place to end the sermon. We rejoice in hope in the glory of God. Once you accept Jesus into your life and once you receive this righteousness by faith, everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be wonderful. You'll never have another problem the rest of your life. Let's say the benediction and go home. But Paul doesn't. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I remember once hiking with my son up a really steep mountain. And when you first start hiking with little kids, you're more of a pack mule than you are a hiker because you're not just hiking, you've got one on your shoulders, right? And I can remember my son say, Daddy, I can't do this, it's too hard. And I remember saying things to him like, you know, keep doing it, you'll get stronger, keep breathing, keep climbing, <laughs> you'll build muscle, you'll be able to do this. Now I hike with him, and I say, son, I can't do this. It's too hard. And he says, keep hiking. You'll build muscle. Keep climbing. You'll make it. Practically quoted me this verse the last time I did that. Suffering produces endurance, Dad. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I got a hunch that if God's love is poured into my heart, I don't ruin family gatherings. You know what Paul says next? We've now come full circle. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. We end where we start. You see, the blood of the saved is the call of followers of Jesus to give blood. To take up their cross and follow him. To live self-sacrificially and to bring the work and the ministry of reconciliation to others. No, they're never saved by your blood. But it may just take your blood and your sweat and your tears to bring people to Christ. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't want to destroy anybody. How do I know he doesn't want to destroy anybody? How do I know that he's not an angry, vengeful God that wants to crush the wicked under his feet in the winepress of his wrath? He doesn't want to. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's how I know. How do I know? Because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how I know. The blood of the saved. Sadly, it too remains. And this should burden our hearts as followers of Jesus, as people who have the love of God in our hearts. Our hearts should ache for the lost too. We too should be brokenhearted for the broken. And we should be working in the ministry of reconciliation with all our might because we're not willing that any should perish either. It's interesting then, almost ironic, that we find this verse in Revelation chapter 6. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and the witness they had borne. First of all, this verse tells me that if you carry the witness of God is love to the world, you'll be persecuted for it. If you carry the witness that God is love to the world, you'll be crushed, not under the feet and the wine press of the wrath of God, but under the wrath and fury of the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. And they cried out in a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, your justice must also include judgment. So how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And they were each given a white robe and told to rest for a little longer 
until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Guess who their fellow servants are? (laughs) Who are their fellow servants? Who's called to that kind of ministry? Self-sacrifice to the point of shedding your blood. And I saw a white cloud. There was one seated on the throne. It looked like a son of man. And he had a sharp sickle in his hand. Father, as we leave this place, we know we are called to the ministry of reconciliation. We also know that while our message feels like a warning message, we are reminded of the words of our early Advent pioneers who said that the last message of mercy to be shared with the dying world is a revelation of God's character of love. Lord, it's you that we are to show. So pour your love into our hearts like the blood of Christ from the cross, and may it flow through us as a wellspring of living water and new life to the world around us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.